So I am, I'm actually going to talk uh, briefly about internships and apprenticeships at CTG because I've, I had a feeling that was going to be one of the top ones. Um, before I get into that, welcome everybody. You are in the right place. This is the Working in Theater Summer Series from Center Theater Group. And um, we have Felipe Sanchez with us. We wanted you to see his face because a lot of you are alumni also of other programs and know him already. So Felipe, hello, good afternoon. Thank you for being in the chat today. Thank you for having me, nice to be here. <laughs> okay, so he's gonna be talking with you in the chat. Um, you can send questions directly to him, especially if you need any technical assistance or, um, or anything. He's also gonna be compiling um, questions as they come up. We're gonna try to address as many as we can in today's session but it's also something that we're noting for the full series too. Uh, so Felipe will say, you, you can turn your video off now. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, so just to talk to, um, uh, to talk about the CTG internship program while others are joining, uh, we do have robust internships, apprenticeships, and observerships at Center Theater Group, as well as a program for high school students that's our student ambassador program that's much like a paid internship program. That program is continuing in the fall. As far as internships go, and some of you may have seen um, our announcement this week that we will have no main stage shows through the spring. Um, a significant percentage of our staff is currently furloughed. Uh, which means it's similar to being laid off. It means that there is no work for them um, and they're on unemployment for the most part. So given that I cannot and we cannot as an organization say all of these team members are being furloughed and there's no work for them, but then we're bringing in interns as well. Do you know what I mean? It feels uh, disrespectful of our furloughed colleagues. Um, and so we, that is the reason why we're halting our internship program at the moment. It's not as simple as like, can you do internships virtually? Sure, we can craft a meaningful virtual internship experience, but it's the larger picture of what's going on in the organization. So uh, as soon as we can ramp back up programmatically, we will be returning to those programs. So look for that. And I'm sorry that they're not there right now, but that's, that's kind of the environment that we're in. If you have questions about that, please drop those in the chat as well. Um, as folks are joining and as that, that poll is going, and I know, Marissa, it, it would be great to choose all of them, but we kind of wanted to gauge where the majority of interest is. Um, so I'll leave that open for another like minute or so for anybody else. And in the meantime, I just want to call out that today is Juneteenth. And Juneteenth, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, is the day that the news of emancipation reached Texas. Um, Hello again, Felipe. <laughs> um, so this was not the Emancipation Proclamation. This was the two and a half years afterward when the news of freedom reached um, formerly uh, enslaved people in Texas. It's recognized as a holiday in many states. Um, and a lot of places are using it as a day of learning and action, including CTG. Um, I'm going to drop a couple of links into the chat. The first is the main website for Juneteenth, which is fantastic. There's a lot of information. And if you are not familiar with this, please check it out. The other thing that I'm going to drop is um, the Juneteenth Theater Justice Project, which is raising funds to support black theaters across the country. GoFundMe. I made a small personal donation to that yesterday on behalf of all of us. Um, but I encourage you all to, to do it as well if you're looking for a place to give your money today. Every little bit helps. Um, okay, I'm just checking the chat. Uh, we, on this series, because we have stuck it in between um, everybody's different school schedules, which are very different campus to campus. We're doing it every Friday, including the Fridays that have holidays. So thank you all for being with us, just acknowledging that, that with all of the, um, the holidays this summer, we still have this session. So thank you for being with us today. 
Um, and thank you for being here to talk about one of my favorite topics, money for artists to do their work. So I get very excited and nerded out about this. And as Lisa knows, my background is in um, fundraising, um, grant writing specifically, and I love this. And I am so happy to see so many of you in this today. Uh, let's take a look at this poll. So I'm gonna end the polling and um, share the results here. So I'm gonna ask our guests to look at this as well as I'm looking at it. So yeah, interesting. So 78% of paid internship or apprenticeship with a theater company. Fascinating. Um, I know a lot of you are in, um, uh, still in college or university. Some of you were in high school. And so this makes sense that you're looking for additional training. Also, I hope one of the takeaways from today's session is going to be that you don't have to limit yourself to training. You don't have to limit yourself to thinking like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not qualified to apply for these other things. I'm, I'm too early career. I need professional credits before I, I apply for these things. Not necessarily the case. So we see also a fellowship for continued study of your craft. Fantastic. Professional development money to go to a conference or take a class. And then followed by a grant to produce a play or other project, uh, a writing creating retreat in a beautiful location, and then friends and family give me money to make art, only 5%. So that's fascinating to me because that's, that is the way that you, um, is anyone interested in starting their own theater company? Go ahead and, and speak up in the chat if that's something that you've considered. Starting your, two, okay. That's, that's money from your friends and family, that's grandma. Y'all, so I hope that's, so you, if you're thinking like, oh, I start my own theater company and I get a grant, most grants organizationally require a couple of years of, um, of producing before they will fund you. So for those 5% of you who said friends and family give me money to make art, all of you who are saying, I want to build my own company, that's, that, that's how you build it, is you start by by asking people to come in. There are other ways, but just, just prepping that because I think the individual fundraising side is the less sexy and fun and a lot more awkward side. Not that any fundraising is sexy or maybe it is. Um, okay, thank you all for that. And now I'm going to introduce my amazing panelists. I sent out their full bios, so I'm not gonna read their full bios. I'm just gonna say that Lisa, is a writer, director, an actor, multi-hyphenate. She's the Associate Artistic Director of Circle X Theater Company. Um, and Abdiel is the Program Associate at the Center for Cultural Innovation, a California-based knowledge and financial services incubator for individual artists. And if you're not aware of CCI, they have an amazing array of programs. And I wonder, actually, Abdiel, can you start us off by talking about your work with CCI and then also just what CCI is kind of writ large. Oops, you're muted. No, I can't hear you. Can you guys hear him? Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was just thanking you, Camille, and thanking no. everyone for the invitation. Um, so yes, I am the program associate at Center for Cultural Innovation based in both LA and San Francisco, but we're headquartered here in downtown LA. Uh, we have, like Camille said, an array of programs. Basically, it was founded, CCI was founded back in 2001, I believe, um, to promote the unfettering of individual artists, production, financial freedom, and self-determination. So we really, the, the founder of CCI, Cora, uh, noticed that there was a lack of money kind of trickling down to individual artists. So she created this incredible organization and through our regranting programs, we've been able to help a slew of artists, fine artists, uh, performance artists, theater artists, literally any kind of artist and creative entrepreneur through our different programs. So right now I am currently the manager or I administer the Cali Accelerator Grant Program. And so that grant program is specifically designed to enable emerging arts leaders to hone in on their artistic 
um, administration leadership and vision through different professional development opportunities, whether that's through a conference, through consult working with a consultant, um, et cetera. We, we give about up to $1,000 for individual artists to work um, with, with um, I guess, different opportunities. And so this is a monthly uh, grant program. So you can apply every 15th for an opportunity that's two months in advance of the deadline. So this is a rolling sort of application, um, again, targeted towards emerging arts leaders. Uh, we also have another similar program called the Quick Grant Program, and that's more of a reimbursement fund, but also for emerging arts leaders, um, emerging professionals in, in the arts. And I think that is an award of up to $600 for anything that you've already done and accomplished. That's professional development. Um, in tandem with, with both of these programs, I work closely with our national initiative, Ambitious, which looks at the alternative economic paradigms across the country and even in the digital world. Um, Ambitious is time limited, and we look at how cultural communities are spearheading this sort of alternative economic work through their different cultural efforts. Um, so yeah, that's the gist of, of what we do right now. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it is such a good resource, folks. That's so I put uh, CCI and then also the Cali accelerator link in there. So I want you all to do an exercise for me, if you would indulge me. Um, I am putting in the chat, the prompt. how would you describe the work you do to a potential funder? So take a second to think about you as an individual artist, however you're coming at this work, if you're a stage manager, if you're a producer, if you're an actor, how in one sentence, let's keep this very brief, and you could start with, I am. So I am, I am a writer who tries to give voice to rural communities. Actor passionate about telling relevant stories. Who are you? If this is this is hard, but this is the work. I am an employment provider. All right, Spencer, I want you to go deeper with that. And casting. Okay, these are all. This this is so hard, and it'll be interesting to see. I am a performer and educator who tries to amplify unheard voices on stage. Nice, Jonah. I am an actor that seeks to tell stories and bring audiences on many different journeys. Really nice. So this is, these are great folks. So this is really an exercise and I'm gonna have Lisa introduce herself next and talk about her, her journey and her work. And, um, and I think these are, now they're really coming in folks and they're really lovely. It's, it's definitely something to practice and think about is how do you describe yourself and how are you different from everybody else in this chat? Because you are all individuals and Bridget is different from Brooklyn, is different from Matthew, is different from Abby, right? And so all of these statements should be uniquely about you. And that's, that's the kernel of how you start to develop this creative voice, right? These are so beautiful. All right, Lisa Dring. We've known Hi. each other since 2008, and you gave such amazing pre-reading material. So if folks have not checked those out, um, please do, because they're really amazing. Uh, Lisa has done uh, an amazing job kind of outlining her funding journey. Um, can you talk about the work that you do, Lisa, and what your approach is to getting funding? for for that work and funding and support and how you define support yeah um i think i heard i you went silent on the last bit because of my connection but um i'll talk about who i am and then how i get money and my approach to getting money yeah so i'm lisa i, I know some of you kimberly uh is on here and then someone goes to cal state long beach hello um and these are all really beautiful, uh, really beautiful descriptions of yourselves. Um, I'd say who I am, I, I get specific with these answers and then I also let it change uh, depending on what I'm doing at the moment. I'm a theater maker, I'm a queer woman of color, 
and I hope to create theater that wakes myself and others up. Um, and, and, you know, depending on the grant or the, the fellowship or whatever I'm applying to, I, I say that in different ways. Um, I, I spend most of my time, I act in like commercials and, and TV, and then I spend most of my time uh, writing plays and directing plays. Um, and also I'm on staff at a theater company that Camille uh, and I were together at uh, many, many moons ago. And um, I'm in a few ensembles around town. Um, so I like to write work about Asian folks. I like to direct work, any work I can. Um, I like to talk about queer folks and what our lives are like. Uh, and then lately I've been getting commissions, so I get to write what people ask me to write and direct what um, people think I'm right for. Um, and can you, so regards, that's, oh, yeah. with commission, so can you say a little bit more about what a commission is specifically? Because that, that term might not be familiar to people. Yeah, so that's when, uh, sometimes you approach a theater, but most of the time theaters approach you and say, hey, we have this idea or we have this slot we have this money and we want to support you as an artist do you want to write for us um, and that's come in, in strange and beautiful ways uh and what also i mean i'll get to this in my funding journey but also at a certain point in your career theaters will approach you and say hey we need a, an artist to collaborate with us for this grant do you want to do you want to get in on this and so it doesn't always have to be led by yourself um but I'm skipping ahead. So back when I was a tiny one, when I was a center theater group uh, intern, <laughs> um, I was in the development department because I had uh, worked four years at the telemarketing uh, section of my university at USC. I don't know if y'all have done that job, but I, I feel like many people have. So I, I raised money. And so I was like, oh, I have this skill. I love theater. I'm, I was just an actor, at, just an actor. I was an actor at that time, but I hadn't branched off um and so and so i i was like oh let's try this out and I, I liked it i was pretty confused about what to do and then i know that the la county arts commission had their uh internship program which i love and it's paid um and then i read all the missions circle x was the only one i applied to because i really loved their mission i hadn't seen any of their work and um, ended up working there for the summer and then volunteering and then being hired part-time and then um, I've been involved in various ways. So at that development internship, I feel like I learned, I just learned how to write grants. I got a little taste of it. Um, and then over the years, I didn't really use that skill. I, I've written a lot of cover letters um, doing the apprenticeship at Actors Theatre as an actor. I definitely wrote a cover letter for that, but that was an audition. Um, and so it wasn't until I put on my own solo show uh, that I was like, oh, I, oh, there's like residencies and there's grants and there's opportunities. And it's funny because Camille, you were the one that said, um, they like to see two shows for playwrights. They're like, if you've done two shows, then funders will look at you. But I also want to say, I was just at the McDowell um, earlier this year, and there was a 23-year-old uh, woman there who's a poet, and she's fresh out of college, and just her work was so strong um, that they brought her there. So uh, I've started to apply for things four years ago, three years ago, I started getting things two years ago. And now um, I've helped Rogue Artists Ensemble write some grants. I'm helping Circle X look at some grants. I'm using skills that I learned 10 years ago to translate uh, into what I'm doing today, which is sort of, I mean, I'm going off, but um, everything sits on top of one another. So the work I do in writing grants also helps me formulate ideas for the work um, that I'm doing on my computer or in the theater, or uh, it helps me pitch for shows. When, when a theater asks me to pitch to direct a show, they'll be like, hey, we like your work. We want you to read this play. What's your vision? And so being able to formulate ideas uh, verbally is really useful. So I'd say that um, I would say you can start applying for things now, even if they're long shots, because by the time they're not long shots, you'll be able to write that really well. Um, I think that's it for now, Camille. <laughs> Do I have more to say? 
<laughs> I think that's a great start. And I love that idea of like, it's a muscle like anything else. And the first time that you're writing about your own work, it's going to feel really strange. And the first time that you're applying for something, it's going to feel a little like, am I ready for this? But then you, you, you push through that. Um, it's just like, I work with interns on job applications and, and it's like, if it doesn't feel like a bit of a reach when you're applying for something, why would you apply for it? Right? Like you, you want to apply for something that feels a little scary and big because that's what's going to be exciting. And that's what's going to take you to the next step in your career. Sorry, what were you going to say, Lisa? Oh, also, it's good to get rejected. <laughs> because the first one, the first few like burn and you're like, oh my God, ow, ow, they hate me. And then by the time you're doing it a few years, you're like, ah, wait, it's just part of it. It's just like, it's like auditioning too as an actor. Like rejection is, is just a healthy part of the process. It's not at all a personal thing or, or an indicator that you should quit doing what you're doing. And I will say too, um, normalize asking for feedback on why you got rejected. I always do that whenever I apply. Uh, and then that just will help you season your application better next time around. So always uh, never be afraid of asking for help and for feedback. And Abdiel, can you talk about what you look for, especially because a lot of the programs that you oversee are specifically looking for people who are early career. What really stands out in those applications if people don't have necessarily professional experience or if they don't have that long resume? What are you looking for? I think the thing that stands out from all the grantees or all the recipients have been that they all understand the vision that they're trying to achieve, whether that's for their specific organization or for the sector as a whole. They, they're under, they demonstrate potential through that statement of how they want to affect their different networks, right? And so I think we don't really, I mean, we, we look at resumes, but we don't place a heavy emphasis on it because we understand how racist, how um, disproportionate funding has been historically. So we really wanna place emphasis on, does this applicant demonstrate potential? What ha have they contributed already? And what do they hope to gain? What skills are they missing? Do they understand how to pull resources together and, um, basically amplify their voice. I think that's also a huge part is knowing your voice and knowing the effect that your voice has on the actual community itself. Um, so th that would be like the, the two key factors that weigh heavily on the applic applicants, um, well, applications. So yeah, I think just understanding that even if you're emerging, just start to develop that voice, start to develop your vision board. I mean, really at, at this stage in your life, what do you hope to be in 10 years? What do you hope to do? And I don't mean that materially, like what do you like fellowship wise, but like, wh who are you in 10 years as an artist? What do you hope to achieve? Are you a community based artist? Are you, you know, whatever, identify that as early as you can, but it's also work in progress. So don't be afraid to just start writing about that, about yourself. And I want to ask Lisa about her journey in, in creating that definition for your work, but I do want to, um, Abdiel, hear more about the issues of systemic racism, classism within the fundraising funding community specifically. Um, because we were we were talking about how CCI is actively trying to work against that, and I wonder if if folks are unfamiliar with that, um, if you can talk a little bit about um, the kinds of things that CC, CCI is doing to create a more equitable uh, funding process. Yeah, so right now we're in the thick of COVID nineteen relief funding, and one of the priorities for one of the funding programs for that up in I believe East Bay was or. Oakland, I'm forgetting um, the specific program, but one of them were specifically identifying people who have been the most injured by these, this extractive economy. And that goes in tandem with our national initiative. We understand how historically certain communities have been barred from accessing resources, capital. Um, and so we, we ultimately look at these communities with an emphasis, like, and we say these communities have been disproportionately injured and are still today barred from a lot of these resources. So we want to shift. It, it's about a systems change model, really. And we're trying to implement that, I think, mainly because of our initiative, but because we saw this great need that artists are facing right now and have always 
sort of face and we see if we help artists specifically with these issues we will help normalize and um, the help for everybody else because artists are not dissimilar to non artists right non artist citizens so if we start to do that now and we start start to model good funding behavior we hope to eventually have our funding partners um, replicate that within their own funding programs because at the end of the day we are regranters so we can only do so much but we can always try to model and strive for modeling um, better funding behavior um, and specifically with artists i think what we saw was that and still in conversations with people outside of our field outside of the sector still don't understand that artists are queer are um you know from communities of color are also disabled right and so i think there's also this idea of shifting the definition of artists itself a lot of the conversations with non-artists center this sort of white supremacist um, definition of what an artist is so we're also specifically naming it i think that's important especially what we're with what we're facing today um it's about calling it out naming it and not being afraid to just tackle it head on and 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 head first so i think that's what was really successful for the grant programs was that we called out the trans communities of color up in up in the bay area right because we understand a lot of uh these communities are not receiving the support from institutional grant makers um, so we're really trying to, it's not, and it's not even about diversifying because it goes beyond that. Again, it's about moving, it's about shifting capital and shifting resources from the margins to the center, basically. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for doing that work. It's, it's essential. And I, I know I keep saying it, but CCI is amazing. And I got, I, I got some of their funding a 10, or more years ago that helped me go to conferences and somebody had asked, are there grants available for people who aren't um, actors and directors? Yes, and CCI is a great place to look. I also recommend Emerging Arts Leaders Los Angeles is a great place where you can um, build your resume for one and then also they, um, there's professional development stipends who goes, that go to people who are on their leadership council too. So. Yes, absolutely. And then can I say something else too? I think we, not we, but I think a lot of people tend to limit themselves when they think of diversity. But we at CCI are not um, stuck with one idea or definition of what diversity means. Diversity could literally mean anything. And that's why we are, we, we help artists all across the state, right? Because we understand too, geographic locations are disproportionately affected by funding or lack thereof. So we're all, always trying to implement and trying to look at diversity from a holistic perspective rather than just whatever any grant make, any um, institutional practices have, have been instituted and trying to just, again, uh, move beyond what's, what's um, disproportionately affected some folks. Thank you. And I love, uh, I love all of the responses in the chat too. Um, Lisa, can you talk about, so going back in time to when you're first starting to write grants, number one, where, where were you finding out about them? And then number two, how, how do you develop your ability to talk about yourself as an artist? Is it just practice? Is mm -hmm. it creating the work at the same, you know what I mean? Like, does it come out of actually making yeah. your own work or how, because I, I the, um, the statements that you shared out, like the McDowell application, I think is one that you shared um, in the Dropbox. They are so clear and specific, and you seem to have such knowledge of yourself as an artist that I'm wondering if you can share how you how you developed that. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, uh, thinking about what finding the grants that are right for you is hard. I would ask all your friends and ask people who are a little further on in your career. I think asking people to be mentors is a great thing even if it's in person like even if it's not official if it's not like you're my mentor um but you know if there's not if you don't know about opportunities in your field just ask around um and i keep finding new places to look for money 
So I would also like to say, because someone asked about stage managers and designers and if there are grant opportunities for you. And I, I would imagine it's trickier um, because playwrights can go off and do the work on their own, whereas designers, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I want to say Rogue Artists Ensemble has Rogue Lab. I co-founded that and it's a creative incubator for new work. So it's, a, it's like a nine month um, writers group, but it's a writer designer group where you both make a play together. So the design is influencing the, the words from the start. And we ask designers of all sorts to apply. I'd also say for stage managers and designers, just email people, email companies you like, even if it's not a grant. Um, it'll like, if you're like, I really love uh, your work. If you do love their work, can, are you, do you need a PA? Do you need an ASM? And then they'll be like, this person's an amazing ASM. Oh, we need an SM. Oh, we have this paid position, come here. I mean, I remember Joey Guthman, um, who is a lighting designer I've worked with before, just emailed um, someone after seeing a, a play we did and was like, I love your work, can I help in any way? And now I've like gotten him paid work from that free thing that we did together. Um, so talking about developing the ability to talk about oneself, it's tricky, you know, I've always been, I'm, I look at language a little like askance, although I work with words a lot um, because at once they, they limit you. You know, I've looked at these grants and having to identify oneself. Like I don't wake up in the morning, Japanese lady, you can do this, but I have to identify myself as such for these funding opportunities. And uh, I think giving languages two things is a really beautiful practice and also understanding that our language is entrenched in white supremacy and capitalism, uh, which I personally have issues with. And I, I want to use language to rupture some of these uh, hegemonic structures that we live in all the time. Like I think about the poet Morbizi Phillips who talks about, um, she says, English feels like a rape in my mouth because she, uh, her, she comes from um, a history of slavery. And so thinking about how you can use this language to disrupt the language is useful because you are not just the box of identity um, that you are placed in. And also you must identify these identity markers to get your money, you know what I mean? So um, in developing the ability to talk about myself, I, I try to take it slow and um, write new words each time. And I think that ability, if I may be so bold, comes from knowing myself. Um, so I would say the more you understand your foundations and the more you align with what you want to do and who you are and find out what you want to give to this world in actuality, the easier the words will come to you. Um, it will not have to be like created in this way. It will not be like, oh, who am I? It's like, ah, who am I right now? Um, yeah, and, and also reading other grants. I mean, there is a little bit of grant speak that you have to adopt and, and certain like, I, I, we wrote a successful grant for um, this UC climate change uh, grant. And so we have this money to go to Japan when people are traveling again. And I wrote my side of the grant and then my friend who's getting a PhD wrote her side and it was all of a sudden like, whoa, <laughs> like she's gonna be a doctor, you know? So I think knowing, uh, knowing the vibe of what you're applying to and then also knowing yourself and, and meeting those in a way that feels right for you. Oh man, there's so much good stuff in there. Uh, one thing that I want to lift up that you said, Lisa, is like, uh, you said something about doing it, making it fresh each time. Um, I think that's something that, that I learned with grant writing um, is you have to answer exactly the question asked. So if two, there are two different applications and one says, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you make the art that you do. And the other one says, um, what is your artistic practice? Those aren't the same question. So really taking the time because I'm, I also sit on a lot of grant panels. I was on one earlier this week and you can tell when there's copy paste happening and it doesn't do you any favors. It's, it's exactly the same as when you're applying for jobs, jobs and you're using the same cover letter for two different jobs. It doesn't read as specific and focused. So taking the time to look at that funding application 
and read what the question is and don't be so quick to be like, oh, I have a paragraph about that somewhere. Let me put that back in there. Um, Abdiel, do you have other, other thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, I'm just nodding my head like, yes, I think one key and often overlooked part of the whole application process is the lack of reading. People don't read and under, underline, highlight what's already being asked of them. And I think just getting into the habit of actually writing in the margins, of writing, writing on the actual application and, and identifying these key phrases, keywords, will enable people to actually identify exactly what is being asked of them. So, I mean, honestly, it sounds so basic, but reading is actually fundamental, like RuPaul always says. <laughs> reading is fundamental. <laughs> Are there more things that you wish that people knew as they were starting to write their first grants or applications for support? Things that you could be like, okay, here, here are the mistakes that people make, or here's what I want to hear from you, either of you. I would say you don't, uh, for me, uh, I don't apply to things. There's so many things to apply to and I, I kind of go intuitively about what to apply for. Even if it doesn't make, you know what I mean? It just kind of feels right because you do have to, you will turn into a robot if you apply for all the things. Um, yeah. Deadlines. Um, people also miss deadlines and unfortunately that or just basic instructions too. I mean, I, I think I'm just repeating myself at this point when I say read again, but deadlines also is a crucial part of the whole application process and just having an agenda or not agenda, but like a calendar view of everything and at a glance view of when your deadlines are um, so you don't miss them. Because we sometimes I get a lot of applications that just miss a deadline by one day. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough wiggle room because we're re-granters, right? So we do have to... Um, do a cutoff, right? And so just even also, um, I think being eligible, understanding if you're eligible or not. Um, we have a whole list of eligib eligibility requirements on the application itself. So just even basic stuff like that, sometimes people don't meet. And unfortunately, we may have to just say, I'm sorry, we, we can't accept you at this time, but you know, please look forward to other opportunities. So just knowing what you're applying to is, is also just helpful. Yeah, and on that, I'd say look at the people who've been funded by it before or who've won the award before. Like, uh, you'll you'll get what what they like. Absolutely, and also if you for those of you who are thinking about starting theaters uh, or who have projects that you want funded, see see who is funding similar people or theaters. So if you're a director who does devised work, you should be able to look up who funds devised work locally. So, and I think all of this is, is, is aligned with what already came up in the first session in which I hope is gonna be a thread throughout the whole summer is that these careers are very active and proactive. And being an artist is not um, something where you sit back and, and let it happen. Um, it, or you can choose to do that or it's going to be harder. And so um, Lisa, you shared that, that image of your, your home uh, or your folder of all of your applications. So I wonder if you could talk about your approach to applying, how much of your time you spend. There's somebody who says like how, Molly says, how do you choose where to stop applying, not become a robot? Um, can you speak to like what your process is, how much of your time you're spending applying for these things and um, what you've learned about that? Yeah, um, yeah, Molly, I, I'm still figuring it out. It's sort of like when my, when I'm exhausted <laughs> is when I stop. But, um, and it's especially strange at this moment, right? Because there's time is a different animal this year. Um, uh, so every month on the first, I've signed up for an email list for playwriting awards and grants. 
uh, it's from Six Perfections, which I shared. And so every month on the first, I'm like, oh, dink, dink, dink. These three I'm good for. Boom. And then I'm like, here's when they're due. And I, I do it off that. Um, there's ones that I have dreams about, like, you know, you know, every year the O'Neill pops up and people are excited about that. Um, but I would just say as long as, you know, you have the heart to do it. I think there's good things about pushing your boundaries and there's bad things about like knocking yourself over and completely destroying yourself for your work. And only you will feel that, you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm growing. Oh, this feels like a good heart and I'm flexing my muscles and my brain is like, oof. Um, but, you know, I think again, like we work to sort of, uh, disembowel some of the ideas of baptism about like you must be like this kind of you, you must mechanize your making you know as as much many of our work systems have done and so I also think it depends on who you are you know if you're a person that works really hard and grinds it out then maybe you need to take a step back and if you're a person that can be like a little lazy um, we know who we are then it's like okay then we create some structures every week I'm gonna do this thing um, but I think it's a really it really depends on who you are. But I would say once a week, spending time um, checking deadlines and being like, how much work has to do for this, especially letters of recommendation, because you don't want to ask those people three days before it's due, because they'll be so upset. Um, but I think like a month is a decent time. Camille, I'm, I, I think you've probably written more letters than me. Um, but like, you have to think about lead in time for materials you have to get, if you have to get a budget together, if you have to ask your collaborators for their bios, like you have to stack this. It's not just like you can write an essay the day before. Um, so I think I'd say making it a, a monthly big practice of identifying what you're going to do that month and then a weekly check in uh, just to see how you're doing. Thank you. There's so many great questions. Um, this Audrey put in a quick one, the amount of money typically awarded, it varies. I mean, there are grants that are $500,000. There are grants that are $200. It just completely varies. There's no average. Um, I want to talk because there are several questions that have to do with feedback and um, applying for the same thing multiple times. Um, so I, I will say as somebody who sees a lot of applications, do not submit the same application again. There is a reason that you didn't get it. Or even if it's not like a huge reason, do not submit the same application. Somebody asked, do you remember it? I remember it. <laughs> and it's also, and as far as asking for feedback, ask for feedback. That's, that's it. When you get that, like, we're sorry that we, we could not fund you or we're sorry that we're not selecting you. That is the time to reach back out and say, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Is it possible that I can get feedback? This is an, an opportunity I'm really interested in. And then when you apply again, you have to incorporate that feedback. But ask for it then, because also what I'll see is like, somebody will apply for something, they won't get it. When I repost it, that's when they reach back out and say, hey, can I have feedback on the last time? So do it in the moment. We, we offer every single person who applies to any of our programs feedback. It's right there if you don't get it. And I would say maybe 10% of people ask for feedback. And sometimes it's like um, your voicemail was full. There's, there's one person each internship cycle whose voicemail is full, so we can't call them in for an interview mm -hmm. every cycle. So ask for feedback. Um, do not submit the same copy paste answers, Monica. Um, Abdiel, do you have other other um, thoughts on that as far as people who are submitting for the same thing multiple times or that sort of the question about getting feedback? Sure, I think one key question that I would like to see come through when people ask for feedback is what can make either my application better or what was missing. I mean, questions like, I mean, really just be straightforward in your question. We're oftentimes more than happy to give you a checklist of things or just identify what was missing or what could have improved. Sometimes also the pool of, of um, applicants was really competitive one season and may not be as competitive the next. So yes, you can, you can reapply um, and ask for feedback. Switch language, incorporate the feedback. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's about it for that one. 
Yeah, most places are happy to give you yeah. feedback and and it can range from like we weren't sure how how your request aligned with these guidelines to like we just felt like you're not quite ready for this yet and and please apply again next year. Whenever you get that note of like please apply again, just take it take it at face value and know that they are saying please apply again because often that means you were like right there. Um and for one reason or another, you didn't get it. But definitely, like reapplying is is healthy and good. And sometimes you reapply multiple times, and then finally you actually get it. But just make sure that you're getting that feedback in between. Otherwise, you're just if you submit the same thing, you and you already got rejected once, you're probably going to get rejected again. Um, Lisa, have you had the experience of applying for some for a specific thing multiple times before getting it? Mm. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> I mean, like the, the festivals and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and you go further every year. I mean, I would say with those, those are like not grants and stuff, but um, no, I would say though, some places say we don't offer feedback. So if they say that at the top, don't ask. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, and you, that's frustrating, but it is what it is. Um, some places also will give you your score breakdown. Um, it's different with different funders. So some places will actually set up a meeting where they'll talk you through all of the panel comments. Um, some places give you the panel comments if it's panel focused. Um, but yes, if it's offered, if it's available to you, you need that feedback. It's, it's only gonna help you moving forward. Um, I'm going to look at, uh, so, so we've, there are a lot of questions about like, um, where to find grants. And I think we've talked about that a little bit and, um, certainly researching people and organizations that are doing work that's aligned with you. Lisa has some amazing recommendations in the, um, the, the materials that she sent out. Um, are there any other things that either of you would recommend as far as people who are looking for for grants and funding? Oh, yeah. Can you repeat the end of your sentence? I think we lost it. Yes. Um, do you have other places that you recommend that people look if they are, I mean, like, let's say somebody has Googled everything about their practice. They have Google stalked the other artists and companies doing similar. Um, I know that that if you're still in school, your career center may have access to things like fellowship applications that that are in line with your practice. Um, but are there other 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 places, databases, anything that has been helpful for you, or has it been a lot of uh, a lot of googling? I would say looking up careers of people you think are dope that are maybe five years ahead of you maybe in 10 years. Yes, I want to echo that completely. I mean, outside of my funder role, that's what I do just on <laughs> for my personal professional life, right, is like I look for role models or people who I would want to be mentored by. And usually their bios have a list of grants and awards that they received. And I look into these grants and awards. And then I just look at eligibility and I mark it in a calendar or wherever if I'm not eligible now, or when their application season will open, etc. So always, I mean, look at your network too, and tell the mentors that you do have what you're, where you are currently in your professional life. And oftentimes they will give you opportunities or they'll share what's, what, um, what they see with these different grants and opportunities. So always, I mean, just really trust your network and, and reach out. And again, there's some really, yes, Natalia, that is such good advice. You just said, go to the theater company's website, do your research, reach out to people who inspire you and or resemble where you'd like to be. That's all great. Artist personal websites are wonderful. If you, if you, if what Christina Wong was sharing last week resonated with you, go to her website, look at everyone who's funded her work, right? So, um, because a lot of these questions get into specifics of who you are as an artist with people going, oh, where can I find uh, funding for X, Y, Z? It's a great thing for you to research and it's a great thing for you to start understanding who is doing that work in your field. 
Um, one thing I talk to people a lot about is uh, going to something like the Ovation Awards, our local theater awards, looking at the winners for whatever type of art you wanna make. So if you're a director, you look at the people who are winning, who are being recognized by um, Ovation Awards or other awards, right? And then you go to their personal websites and you see who's funding them. So it's a whole like, let let your research take you in all of these different directions and and just kind of follow those rabbit trails. And you'll start to see things repeated too, right? You'll start to see like, okay, well, these two directors both got this fellowship. They're doing work that's interesting to me. I should definitely go look at that fellowship. Um, I think Leah's question is interesting. Lisa, can you speak to what sort of organizational system you use to track all of this? Because this is, you, you are applying for a lot of stuff. Are we talking about Excel? Are we talking about like calendar reminders? As we, for me, I make Google invites when I know something's due. So I'm like, this, it'll pop up of like, in two weeks, this is due, boom. And I do it and I set it for yearly so that I have all of them, they pop up all the time. Whenever I hear something that I think is good for me, I set a yearly invite. And then, um, you know, the ones you get. Also, submittable.com, which is where a lot of places uh, receive applications, have a register for you. So it, it says like waiting list or, or rejected or confirmed. Um, but I think, uh, you know, an Excel sheet wouldn't hurt. I know uh, Lisa Liang, who's a great solo performance um, artist and actor. She keeps a, a chart and she's like, oh, I got 95% rejections this year. What a good year. She also makes her living doing this thing. So like, if that's her track record, you got to go for it. I would also say making a website is great. If you don't have anything to apply to, spend time building your website. And um, also horizontal networking is really good too. Not just looking at people who you think are like there, but uh, you know, if you have an accountability person, if you're like, let's do this together, can, you, can we read each other's work? Um, can we share information? That helps me. Love it, buddy system. <laughs> um, Lisa, you talk about support and your definition of support and what support means in your career. Um, I know that's in the materials that you sent out, but can you speak to, to how you talk about that? Because I think that's, it's a nice way of thinking about things and um, it might be helpful for others. Yeah, well, I would say when I was an apprentice at Actress, when I was a young child, no, um, when I was an actress theater, uh, I was an apprentice, I was 23. And Jen, I like asked for a coffee with Jennifer Bielstein, who was the manager and director. Then I was like, what, what advice would you give yourself? And she said, I would have taken a year off and gotten in an RV. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's her advice. Um, so I think, you know, and, and going through life, like I think as an artist, you must have things you want to express about your life in order to be a good artist. You can't just make, make, make. It has to be rooted in like some beauty and some joy you have and connection with being alive and so i would just really champion the idea of supporting yourself as a person um before you know in artists you have to commodify yourself in some ways which is great we sh you know may we be so lucky as to make our money from our work but um also you are a human living and breathing on this planet for a very short time so the, uh, finding ways that regenerate your life force are really useful. And then I would also say your day job is your grant fund. You know, like no, if your day job pays for your art, um, there, wherever you make your money is where you make your money. You are just as much of an artist, uh, no matter how much money you make. Love that, thank you. Um, I had seen, okay, so there are a few questions about when people think that they are ready to um, self-produce. Um, Lisa, I, what was that journey for you? And um, 
what are some ways that people can start to ease into kind of creating their own creating their own work because i know that's that is a helpful way to kind of build your resume and get yourself ready to apply for the bigger funding um, opportunities totally um well someone's someone wrote son of Semily solo creation festival which i did um i started playwriting as a, as a solo performance artist at USC, I took a class and then I let it go. And then at my apprenticeship um, at Actors Theater, they just had that as a part of the program. You did an eight minute solo show. And then I didn't really, you know, I let that go. Um, I also was really interested in, in just making, so I've always been like, oh, I wanna make stuff. So then I was producing with my friends. We took a show to the Fringe, the New York Fringe and the Hollywood Fringe with Circle X. And then I produced this garden um, garden series in New York where we, we did plays in gardens at different boroughs. So I think, you know, what's useful if you don't feel ready to produce your own work is helping your friends produce their work. If you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to like do that, then be the admin person for someone else because it's gonna give you all these skills. I'd say Hollywood Fringe is great, New York Fringe, Edinburgh Fringe, um, well, that's very costly. Um, and then also, if you are in a some sort of teaching program or apprenticeship, like I was an intern slash apprentice at Bread and Puppet, which is like a sort of a commune theater company out in Vermont. And I just wanted to work on my show. And there's a bunch of people there that could just watch your stuff. So I did a 10 minute new solo show um, just because I had it in me to do. So you can do, etudes you can do little things in your in your garage you know I, I i once did a devised work for a nursing home just with my friends because i thought it was important to make work for people who are close to death um so i'd say it, it's a little bit like um you're thinking the if and and i've thought this too but like if if i'm like am i ready to do a solo show that's kind of looking at it from a way I would recommend going the other way and saying like, is there something in me that needs to be said? And um, letting that grow and pull you away. L meaning like working on that, even if you're like, I never have to show anyone this. If you keep working on it, then its momentum will carry you into the next thing. But there's great opportunities, the solo creation festivals. Um, we the People at Sacred Fools is a great way to do short work, um, political work, um, and I'd say Meet Cute is a way for playwrights and directors to uh, do work together. It's again a short opportunity. Who else? It's not the, um, the Playwrights something. Abdiel and Camille, you might know better than me. The Playwrights, Inkwell. Inkwell is a great, they have an open mic night for work. So if you just want to create venues, um, for your stuff to be heard without having to sell tickets. There's so many places where you can just do little offerings until the work that needs to go to a professional venue speaks so loudly that you must take it there. Such a beautiful way to put it. That's super helpful. Um, Abdiel, there have been a few questions from folks who are saying, well, can I apply for things if I am an actor? Um, CCI's support for individual artists is not based on um, specific categories, is that correct? And do you have advice for folks who are like, well, I, can't, I don't have like a show I'm developing or I don't have a project I'm developing, I am an individual artist. Are there, are there places that you might recommend them to go or things that they can think about? So the first, question, the answer to that is yes and no. Um, currently with our relief funding program, we are limited to what the funders want. So we are for some for some of these programs, limiting it to fine artists or musicians. Um, but for the most part, I think what we really want to see is how do we enable artists of any field of any particular sector, um, gain experience, gain professional development experience. I think for us, what we want to do is more than is go above and beyond the artistic practice and equip artists with different tools um, that will also advance them in their career um, as of for the second question which was resources okay that's a that's a good question um <laughs> i don't know if i have any off the top of my head that i know i wasn't mentioned <laughs> 
I think it goes, I mean, we, we could say this goes back to research and research right. people mm-hmm. who are doing this kind of work. And then, and Lisa really did put a lot of different, yeah. there's a lot in what, what she shared out. So I think there would be some in there which would be available to, to actors um, as well. Um, I want to ask folks, if you do have more questions to um, feel free to pop it into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, Margaret, there, I had put the website for CCI there. There's, uh, I think there are many different professional development opportunities. I know there's early career funding for things like conferences, that sort of thing. Um, Abdiel, anything else that you want to say about uh, professional development funding? Yeah, so we also have, um, you can organize a conference panel, uh, being the face of a project at your institution. Uh, we look for external leadership opportunities, um, whether that's also a presentation at a festival, um, you know, what have you, um, co-authoring an article, uh, again, working for, working with a consultant maybe you're transitioning into an executive leadership position and you want to gain tools on how to manage a board, on how to manage finances, that I think is also really, it, it, it speaks a lot about your willingness to learn and openness to learn. So we, those are some professional development areas that we have funded before and, and are successful. And the applicants have been super successful. They've gained and acquired so many skills beyond what they wrote in the application. So those are some examples. Fabulous. Thank you. I, I think I applied for several CCI professional development funds and a couple of them were for trainings and a couple of them were to um, attend conferences and just it, it made such a difference. And I was also in Emerging Arts Leaders LA, which I'd mentioned earlier and got um, funding through them to do similar trainings and stuff. Um, there was a question that, that came through about um, those who want to own and operate a theater, what position should we look for when it comes to applying for internships and jobs? There's so much in that question, Jessica. <laughs> um, and uh, other folks are also asking about work. Um, no easy answer to that because there are a million different ways to do it. And um, the, the, the thing I do want to say about those who want to own and operate a theater, if you're thinking of starting a theater, and some of you will be like, I don't, I don't, I don't like the way that she's putting that, but think about if you were going to start any kind of a business, because it's kind of a business, but if you were going to start a restaurant, you would go into the community where you wanted to st start the restaurant. You would probably eat at the other restaurants. You would look around and say, okay, well, is the restaurant that I want to start, are there other people who, are, are, who already have a restaurant like that, right? Is my, how is my restaurant going to fit into this community? If you are hoping to make your own work, start your own theater, that's what you need to be doing in that art area. So you need to be seeing a ton of theater. So if, if you want to do crazy work that is mostly devised and involves puppets and you start applying for, for grants saying like, I, I want to do this crazy work that involves puppets in Los Angeles and no one else is doing this, there are people doing that, right? So making sure that you understand the, the, um, the context in which you want to start your organization or business or bring your project in and who else is doing that question or who else is doing that that work um, and it, it's just helpful and it's helpful in finding your point of difference and it can also be helpful in finding your collaborators because if you do if you are seeing theater doing research and you discover oh my god actually there's a group who's doing this at a really high level and maybe I don't want to start my own thing maybe I want to go and take over that thing um, go take over that thing Right. Um, so that's got it. I don't know, Lisa, do you have thoughts on that as well? I mean, I got really lucky with Circle X because it was small. And so you could, I was like, I'm in this development internship, but I could do all the things because, um, because it was flexible like that. I would say, so I think what Camille is saying makes a lot of sense because every theater is its own wild monster and so uh i would look at who the artistic director is because if you're a director uh and you want to be an ad you'll find a 
like going to a place where the director has become the AD is useful. There's some playwrights, um, producers are ADs, there's some designers that are ADs. So I, I would say it, seeing what your primary focus is and then trying to find leadership that you can learn from and how they see it, um, like learn from how they, their lens basically and how they see it. Um, but yeah, shop around. Um, and I think to go, go where, you know, go where the work touches you. Beautiful, thank you. We have a few more questions coming in. Um, there are questions about whether you own work if it's been commissioned. I know there was a there was a controversy a few years ago where um, there was a grant for uh, creating something on public transportation, but then in the fine print was like then the public transportation entity owned the work that you would have created. So. Um, are there issues, Lisa, around ownership and um, and who gets to kind of produce the work when you are commissioned to do something? Um, it depends on each one. Like the plays I write with rogue artists are 50-50 rogue artists, but it's also because they, they get really involved in the playwriting in a way that's really lovely. Um, usually you it's yours after, unless it's been, if it's been devised or something and written in collaboration, that's when it gets tricky. But I would say, you know, uh, just get a contract beforehand because sometimes too people want the first rights or they're like develop you know they have to be uh credited in some way um but it, it's case by case but yeah usually it's yours um i do want to get there's a few questions that i can just bop through if that's okay um for a website i would say if you're if you have a multi-hyphenate just put like multiple areas if you want to check out my website there's a few like actor and director and writer jennifer chang also is a hyphenate artist that she she has a really good website um eileen asks performer actor opportunities are there grants i would say it's it's a little trickier i would say that you can get grants and funding opportunities to go to training and that's where you can meet a lot of people that will hopefully hire you in the future and who you can get to know really well so although it feels like a little bit like ah you have to make your own work you can't um do that there is money for you um Audrey, and, and I didn't quite answer your question, Audrey, about when you're ready to produce a play about the person who inherited money. I would say like, I'm like, sometimes you make bad art, man. I think that that person was probably ready and it just wasn't very good, but like how much they grew from that and how beautiful that their, their like um, inheritance could fund that. Um, are there grants at school? There's a lot of grants for people who are just graduating or looking to, but that I didn't know about. So first there's grants within your school to make work. They have like slush funds everywhere. And also it's sneaky. If you go outside the theater department, if you've got like, if you're writing about plants, go to like the botany department and see if they have funds because often they do. Um, and then also like Humanitas has a graduating senior grant. There are grants for people making work that are, that are either leaving school or, or just graduated. And I unfortunately don't know about them, um, but they're there. Um, There's a question um, that I wanted to highlight. Um, it's an anonymous question that came in the Q&A. It's, have you ever felt disadvantaged in the artist community or applying for financial? financial aid as a BIPOC, a person who identifies as BIPOC. Um, I wonder if either of you want to speak to that. I mean, I think that, that either of you could comment on um, Abdiel from the funder side, um, or Lisa, if, if that's something that resonates with you. Abdiel, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to go? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't, I think, let's see, that's an interesting question. Um, obviously, we at CCI prioritize that kind of funding um, to communities that have been disadvantaged um, because we recognize the, how, how um, the extractive economy has not prioritized these communities. Um, so we do, I mean, we do look for for applications that are at the intersection of so many different communities as well. Um, and how artists are supporting their own cultural communities, right? And how 
they are using their artistic practice professional development to enhance their communities. And I think that's also why our initiative is so responsive to cultural communities. And that culture piece is really important because there's a social historic cultural historian who says cultural as I believe it was cultural change begets political change. And that has been really the quote and the motto that we really take to heart for all these different funding, right? Funding programs. Um, if, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. We, 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 I don't know if I answered the question. I don't know what the slant for the funder would be for that question, but. I guess no. if you, if you were um, appointed the head of the NEA, mm -hmm. bro, um, or the James Irvine Foundation or the Wallace or any of the larger foundations. And what, um, what changes would you want to see? What changes would you make to the way that funding is distributed? Right. I know that's such a big question. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it is a big question, but that's exactly what we're trying to model with, with our, again, going back to this national initiative, right? Because that has trickled down to our different funding programs, even for the Cali Accelerator program. Right now we're, we're even, we're thinking about if it's relevant or not because of what's happening with this COVID moment. How can we best allocate resources to the people that haven't, that are, that are most hurt by this moment? Um, so whether that's funding artists, giving unrestricted funds is a huge thing. Also the way funders are asking their grantees to report I mean, that has been such an extractive, I mean, there's just too many parameters around funding that we've seen that we want to eliminate. Why do we need so many different guidelines for how do you report your progress? How do you check in with your funders? I mean, ultimately, we just want to give you the runway capital because we trust you. And, and it's about developing that trust with the artists, with the grantees slash investees. Um, and knowing that, I, I think once you understand the historical implications of funding and the, his, the history of funding itself, I think you begin to try to strive towards a systems change model where you don't have to, uh, I guess, micromanage the NVST and you just trust them, right? So I think ultimately that's kind of where we're headed. So we're investing in so many different alternative um, models, hybrid models that use cooperative um, structures and 501c3 structures with our national initiatives. So we're not, we're, we're experimenting. And I think our, our goal with this is to tell funders, please experiment. People are doing incredible work. You can also do it that go, and it goes above and beyond your current funding structure, but also look inwards, right? Look, look at your board of trustees, look at who's, who's on your staff, employ the people who you're actually trying to help, right? Through your grants. If you don't have uh, a board that understands what certain communities are facing, I mean, it might be really difficult for you to actually deploy these funds in a useful and productive manner. So also look inwards and it's all a systems change model. And this is the moment. This is the disruptive moment that we've been, at least in ambitious, we've been trying to, um, I guess, opportunely use to um, disseminate this information from our initiative. Can you, you, so I, I put some things into the chat just for folks to, to look up if you don't, um, if you're not familiar with them, some concepts, but can you talk about what you mean by unrestricted and project? Mm -hmm. if folks are new to that, that kind of grant language around the different types of funding. Right, so a lot of our investees for Ambitious um, receive unrestricted funding. So we don't even want you to tell us if you use it for staff, um, for employee, what is it, um, costs or general operating costs, or if it's, if it's because you wanted to buy a printer for your office, we, we realize that all of that is helpful for your mission, for what you're trying to accomplish in your community. So we don't even, just do it. Just, just use the money however you see fit because we trust you. I mean, we're, we're literally entrusting you with our money and that is a risk, but it's worth it even if, in 10 years, your organization, organization ceases to exist because it still was helpful for a community at a certain point. So unrestricted is, is basically no strings attached. You can use it however, however way you feel is, is needed the most. So right now, especially with COVID-19, people are, are using it in different ways, whether that's to pay rent, you know, I mean, really just, we want, we trust you and we 
believe in you. That's, I think that's the key word or the key phrase is it's believe in you money, basically. It's that friends and family donation. And I think we want to do that at a funder level. That's wonderful. Yeah. So that's if you're on the, the fundraising side, mm -hmm. the general operating or unrestricted are the the often the most helpful grants because it's what enables you to keep doing the work, although the specific ones are also very helpful. Uh, oh, man, there are. Yes, grants absolutely will specify whether or not they're unrestricted. All of the, all of that's going to be in the, the language about how to apply. And also things like what is allowed. Some of them have different percentages of like administrative costs that are allowed, staffing costs that are allowed. Some of them can't pay for anything related to food and travel. So that it goes back to Abdiel saying like you got to read it really carefully so that you don't get knocked out of the running because you asked for the wrong type of funding, right? Um, oh, there was something that I wanted to lift up. Lisa, did you, were you going to say something? Um, I would say in, in regard to uh, feeling like losing an opportunity, if that has a relation to my phenotype, who knows? Yes, and also no worries, you know, like just keep applying. Yes. And uh, folks are also asking about how to get grant writing experience. Um, you can, outside of like specific internships. So one, one of the other things I talk to people all the time about as like an internship coordinator is I'm often the position of recommending that people do not apply for internships at Center Theater Group. Here's the reason why. If you apply for something, and this is jobs too, at a very large organization, your focus will be very narrow. So in my job, I do, I am a specialist, right? Because we are at a very large organization. It's gonna be the same if you have internships at a very large organization, you're gonna be in a department. If you are like, I want an internship experience where I can learn how to write a grant and I can sit in on rehearsals and I can shadow a director for a day and I can do like breadth. If you want breadth, that's a small organization. So that's what that's what I had in my internship is I was with a small organization where I had the freedom. It was I was the highest paid employee as the intern <laughs> and um, it was so small that I could do all of those different things. So it's something to think about. So if you're looking for experience writing a grant, you can get involved with a small theater or other organization, volunteer with them and ask. I'm really interested in learning how to write grants. Can I help with anything? Can I write one? Um, Emerging Arts Leaders Los Angeles is also a great place to do that. They have a fundraising um, committee. And you can you can write grants for that too, and then you can apply person just as a as a human person for your own funding, and that is a way to uh, to get experience as well. So you can apply for some of the CCI funding opportunities and uh, build your skills that way. I'll also say that applying for things like fellowships or jobs is a, it's very similar to grant writing. Um, it's 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 the same process of being able to say what you want in a short amount of time. Um, and a lot of theaters are, are offering workshops and stuff right now because they can't do in person programming. So a lot of people are pivoting to do educational things online. And I would say, Camille, you know this group because I'm forgetting it. There's a Yahoo listserv. It's like LA Theater or something, and they often have workshops and stuff. Do you know the name? There's Los Angeles Culture Net. Yeah. And there's also big cheap theater. Uh, just some things, some things to look up. Um, Arts for LA has training. Um, uh, what is it? Oh my gosh, Los Angeles LA Stage Alliance. Oof. Lots and lots of free trainings through there. Uh, Southern California Grant Makers. Abdiel or Lisa, are there other places that offer kind of fundraising training that you can think of? Sorry, so CCI has um, a business of art workshop as well. And so we actually take um, artists on this sort of journey, multi-week journey on how to 
fundraise for their own art, for their own practice. Um, so we have those workshops and that's a yearly thing. And I think we're publishing the third edition of that book. So if you miss the workshops, you'll have the actual um, guide, so to speak, of the business of art. But we also have routine workshops. I think one that's coming up or one that already just happened was how to communicate in white people. And that's, I mean, that's kind of a funny title if you think about it, but it's how do you, um, yeah, how do you, write grants for your own practice and unfortunately we understand that foundations are you know this in the, entrenched in this sort of white supremacist model so how do you code switch and how do you navigate that that whole structure you know so anyway so we do have a lot of workshops and, and that's on our website amazing and i think school your school probably has some of that and even if you're a recent grad that you can do workshops with them Yes, absolutely. That's yes. It doesn't hurt to ask your career center. Um, and there are some other amazing resources that are being mentioned in the chat too. Um, and yes to community colleges, to your colleges. They're so affordable and um, our primary partners at Center Theater Group are, is East Los Angeles College. So just shouting out ELAC. But also I know we have a lot of LA City College folks who are taking this. Santa Monica College, Glendale City College. So yes, there's so much. Uh, oh, California Lawyers for the Arts. Thank you, Audrey. Great. Uh, <laughs> oh, LACC. Um, we are almost at time. I think we've been able to answer most of the questions. So if you have final questions, get them in. Um, are we looking at the Q&A section? There's like a, at yes. the bottom, there's a Q&A thing. Yes, um, I've been looking at that one too, but if you see any others, but um, folks, do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to leave people with as they're looking ahead at, uh, at potentially applying for funding for themselves or projects that they have? I think earlier we were talking about how do we not become robots when applying and that also I think entails understanding who your potential funder might be and making sure that their value aligned with you their values aligned with you and their mission aligned with your work um, and again it kind of goes back to reporting if they have um, way too many you know restrictive uh, reporting guidelines like do you really want to do that uh, do you really want to be funded by them so it's also just kind of looking at their organization too not just the other way around Thank you for saying that. That's wonderful. That's, yes, yes. Do you want to, you, you always have a choice, right? Lisa, anything that you want to, um, you want to leave folks with? No. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. And, you know, I, I hope for everybody, everybody who's here today, I hope you feel empowered to start in applying for things it's it's really it's a muscle you do not have to wait it's what we talked about last week that nobody is going to be like boop now you're a playwright just try it and um White. i think you all have my um my email i will put it in the chat i'm always available to to help or to take a look at applications i would love to do that um so feel free to use me as a resource and um Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Abdiel. It's been so lovely sharing this time with you. Thank you so much, and everybody else. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. All right. Have a lovely, have a lovely weekend, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> Bye.